Welcome back to the Project Censored radio show. I am very glad to be joined by Leonardo Flores, who is a Latin American campaign coordinator for Code Pink. Before that, he was senior policy analyst at the Venezuelan embassy. He was born in Venezuela and maintains close ties to social movements that have transformed the country over the past 20 years. Thanks so much for being here, Leo. Oh, thanks for the invite, Eleanor. So I wanted to, uh, to to invite you on to discuss what's going on with Venezuela, um, because there's been a bit of a shift in uh, in relationship uh, in, uh, in the past few weeks. Uh, so following Biden's ban on Russian oil imports back in early March, uh, Venezuelan President Maduro confirmed that he was going to restart conversations with opposition parties uh, after a U.S. government delegation met with him in Caracas, uh, as I understand it, basically to beg for oil. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, since that meeting happened, what is the current status of, of, of those talks uh, with regards to that oil? Yeah, I mean, first of all, that was a really interesting meeting because I think it was the first time in over 20 years that the White House had sent an official to Caracas. And the people they sent were Juan Gonzalez, who's the National Security Director for the Western Hemisphere, and James Story, who's the ambassador for what they call the Venezuela Affairs Unit, uh, and this is basically the U.S. embassy operating out of Colombia because they no longer have a presence in Venezuela. And so, you know, the meeting was described as respectful, cordial, and very diplomatic. And as you said, right after the meeting, President Maduro announced that he was restarting the dialogue with the several factions of the opposition. What's come out of it, it's not clear yet, right? Because immediately after news broke that the Biden administration had sent these envoys, you know, the, the right wing went nuts, particularly uh, you know, politicians in Florida and not just the right wing ones, but Democrats as well. You had Marco Rubio having a meltdown on Twitter when when, when that news broke and saying it was kind of a betrayal of, of the Venezuelan opposition. Because in fact, Juan Guaido, the guy who calls himself the president of Venezuela, the interim president, supposedly, he actually didn't even know about this meeting until after it happened. So there's a lot of kind of egg on his face. And, and it just goes to show how he's been sidelined completely, not just in Venezuela, but kind of internationally now. Uh, but, you know, there's been so much pushback that I think the Biden administration is keeping things very close to the vest. It's not clear what's going to happen in the future, although we do know that Chevron is lobbying very hard to be able to resume operations in Venezuela. So they've been approaching members of Congress talking about a potential oil for food deal, which is really kind of a non-starter from the Venezuelan perspective. But it is just goes to show like how kind of the different tra trajectories that the conversations are, are taking on in terms of being able to restart relations with Venezuela between the US and Venezuela and to buy oil again. Right, so I'm I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, because you mentioned it's it's really a non-starter, and there are still crippling sanctions, uh, economic warfare against Venezuela. How is that? I mean, that seems to be like the elephant in the room. Like, well, if you're so desperate for oil, then uh, how about you know easing this economic warfare that you have against Venezuela? How do you see that at play? Yeah, so it's really interesting because when we talk about the U.S. economic war on Venezuela, we can really trace it back to at least 2014 when Congress passed what's called the Venezuela Defense of, of Civil Society Act, uh, of Humanitarian Law and Civil Society Act, something to that effect. And then the next year, Obama passes, uh, issues an executive order calling Venezuela an unusual and extraordinary threat to the United States, which is just patently absurd, of course. But they really take kind of a, a kind of an uglier dimension during the Trump administration because he starts to sanction the oil industry, he's, he's sanctioned the gold industry, uh, he sanctioned Venezuela's cryptocurrency. And then in August of, of 2020, he, he imposes what the J Wall Street Journal called a full economic embargo of Venezuela, which is basically true. And one of the things that is about this, these sanctions imposed by the Trump administration is they've, they've had a horrible impact, not just on Venezuela's economy, which dropped, uh, you know, revenues dropped by something like 99%. You know, we're talking about losses between 31 billion and $194 billion, depending on the economists you talk to. But it also had a huge impact on the health of Venezuela. So there was a really interesting study that came out from the Center for Economic and Policy Research, a think tank in DC, which said that in the first year alone, the sanctions had killed 40,000 Venezuelans. That number was later updated by Alfred de Zayas, who was a former UN Special Rapporteur, and he said it's the likely number now is something like 100,000 Venezuelans have died in the four or five years since the, the Trump administration imposed those sanctions. But something really curious has happened. 
despite the fact that Venezuela's economy was just completely decimated, it's actually on the rebound. So Credit Suisse, which is this big kind of financial firm, they came out last week with, with news that they are predicting 20% economic growth for Venezuela in 2022. And they made sure to say that this was not a typo. So it, it doesn't seem also that this 20% includes any sort of sanctions relief. So that number could skyrocket if there is indeed sanctions relief. So Venezuela has been kind of slowly but surely been able to adapt to the US sanctions and to find ways to evade them. And the economy is growing. In fact, inflation, you know, when we talk about Venezuela, people love to talk about the hyperinflation in Venezuela. Well, the hyperinflation is actually over. Inflation was down, down to just 1.4% in March. I think that's seven straight months of, of slowing inflation. You can feel like when, when you're in Caracas, in Venezuela, you can feel that the economy is restarting. So right now, you, although the sanctions are still causing immense harm, Venezuela is finding a way to counteract them. And so even without, even if the Biden administration does nothing, I think Venezuela will slowly improve, but of course it can't fully recover until the Biden administration lifts these sanctions. And it's having, you know, the, these sanctions have had not just impacts on health and the economy, but also they've been one of the main drivers in migration out of Venezuela because people, you know, if you don't have a job, if you're struggling to make ends meet, you're gonna find, go look for opportunities elsewhere. And this in turn has kind of destabilized uh, the situation for many countries in the region that haven't been able to kind of afford this influx of migrants. So, so it's not just a, a question about how the sanctions impact Venezuela. It's also that these sanctions are having an enormous impact throughout Latin America because Venezuela has been kind of a pretty key economy in Latin America in terms of not just regional integration, but in terms of, you know, sending oil uh, to other countries. So for example, Venezuela used to send oil at a very discounted price to all of the countries, or not all, but almost every country in the Caribbean, particularly the smaller islands under this scheme called Petrocaribe, and that was ended by the sanctions. So, so there are a lot of you know, interested parties in seeing these sanctions lifted, and it, I think it's going to be you know, a, an important fight to see what happens, because there are people in Congress pushing for sanctions relief, including uh, the House Foreign Affairs uh, chairman Greg Meeks from New York, who, who you know recently pushed the Biden administration on that. So yeah, the economic warfare is harsh, but Venezuela is finding ways around it. So it's interesting times for for the Biden administration to come, kind of begging for oil from from Venezuela, because you know obviously Venezuela does want to see the sanctions lifted, but they're not going to you know shoot themselves in the foot by by agreeing to uh, you know demands that the Biden administration might want to impose. Yeah, and I th I think it's you know the the, the ridiculous name that uh, that that you mentioned that Obama gave the the uh, executive order. It really goes to show uh, that you know sanctions are not put in place because a country is a grave threat to the U.S. or that a country is a human rights violator. Because obviously, if that were the case, that would still be true even though we need oil, in which case you would keep the sanctions in place, right? Because human rights are more important than oil, right? Question mark. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And, and look at the other countries we buy oil from, right? Like Saudi Arabia. How is that? That's clearly more of a threat than Venezuela in any you know, sense of the word and in terms of human rights and democracy or lack thereof. So, so it is kind of a, a total you know, act of hypocrisy, let's say, for the U.S. to kind of use these kind of archaic laws in order to impose economic warfare on a people just because, and, and again, Venezuela has done nothing to the U.S., right? There's been no act of, acts of aggression from Venezuela. All Venezuela has done is undertake a revolution over the past 20 years that sought to impose sovereignty for itself and to impose a new economic model, not impose, and I mean, this is an economic model that's been voted on time and time again at the polls in Venezuela, elections that are actually much more fair and freer than the one we have here in the United States, despite what we read in the media. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's such blatant hypocrisy that, that the US government engages in when it comes to, to regime change efforts. So how, do, with regards to the sanctions, how do you think, uh that, you know, what, what do you think would be a good play here for Venezuela in terms of, you know, moving those chess pieces to get that kind of relief in the face of this oil request? Well, I think we're seeing it already. So right after, so, so it's interesting because in December, the State Department sent this guy to Venezuela called, whose name is Roger Carstens. He's the U.S. Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs. Uh, there are no host U.S. hostages in Venezuela, but there are several people in prison who have either U.S. citizenship or U.S. green cards. So among them are these six CITCO executives, all of whom are either dual U U Venezuela U.S. citizens or they're Venezuelan citizens with U.S. green cards. 
Whenever you read about them in corporate media, they're presented as American executives who were somehow kidnapped by Venezuela. That's not true. These are guys that were involved in corruption, that were, you know, had a, a due, due process, had a trial. They were found guilty. They've been in jail for in Venezuela for a couple of years. Some of them have been released to house arrest because of the pandemic. And so, and, and in, in addition to these six, you have three former members of the US military who were basically caught in Venezuela in the act. Two of them were involved in the kind of failed mercenary invasion that happened in, uh, I think it was May, 2020, where you had a bunch of mercenaries, including Green Berets come from Colombia and try to kind of do this amphibious attack, uh, assault on Venezuela. And they were captured by a group of fishermen basically. And you have another Marine who was caught with weapons, explosives, and surveillance equipment outside of an oil refinery. So this is all really part of the kind of, not just the economic war in Venezuela, but the hybrid war in Venezuela. So there's these been ongoing discussions about these people between the US government and the Venezuelan government. Right after the meeting with the White House officials in March, President Maduro released two people. He released one of the Citgo execs, and he also released this Cuban American guy uh, who is, again, if you read about him in the media, he, in the corporate media, he's described as a tourist. In actuality, he was a guy who was trying to smuggle in a drone from Colombia into Venezuela. And the Venezuelan authorities are very sensitive to that because in 2018, there was an assassination attempt of President Maduro using drones laden with C4 explosives. Investigations show that the, these, the people behind this are very much tied to the Juan Guaido fake interim government, which didn't exist then, but basically tied to the Venezuelan extremist opposition. So I think the move from the Venezuelan government is going to be, A, I mean, they've released these two people, which is great. And then this week alone, we've already had new conversations between the Venezuelan government and sectors of the opposition. So these were co conversations are actually kind of a restarting of a dialogue that had begun, began in August of 2021 and went on for two months in Mexico between the government and the faction of the opposition led by Juan Guaido. These are kind of the more extremist guys, the people who are calling for sanctions, invasions. They've attempted a coup. They want nothing to do with actual you know, politics or democracy. They just want power. And then there's a kind of another section of sector of the, of the opposition, which, which we call a more moderate sector, not because their policies are moderate. Many of these people are you know, neoliberals and would privatize the entire economy but because they're actually willing to play by the rules of democracy and they've engaged not just in dialogue, but they participate in elections, whereas the extremists have boycotted them. So this move by Maduro to restart the dialogue is, is, and is you know, I think should yield positive results. I don't know that they have many more pieces to play other than what they've already been doing, uh, but we're gonna see more and more pressure on the Biden administration as gas prices stay where they are, which is pretty high, or as they might get higher as the, conflict in Ukraine uh, you know, escalates. So I think the onus is really gonna be on the Biden administration and how they can kind of navigate the internal uh, dynamics of, 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 of domestic pressure, domestic policy, and, and specifically Florida and how Florida Democrats might do in the midterm elections. Because basically Venezuela policy has been held hostage for the past 20 years to extremists in Florida because you have a huge uh, community of Cuban Americans and a growing community of Venezuelan Americans who not only have votes, but they have a lot of money and they keep put, putting all that money into funding politicians who are gonna support regime change. And that's been why you know, the US government has been kind of stuck in this kind of hardcore policy towards Venezuela when it's clear that for everyone involved, because you know, the sanctions, obviously they, the impact is mostly felt by Venezuelans, but they also are, have impacted U.S. businesses, which used to do a lot of business with Venezuela, but that is cratered as well. So, so I think the moves are really going to have to be made by the Biden administration rather than the Maduro administration. And I'm also curious, um, I, I do want to circle back to Guaido because I find that bizarre and hilarious. Um, but I'm curious too, because, you know, it, you said that Chevron is is lobbying to, to, to get these sanctions lifted because, of course, they they want to get down there. How would you see that playing with the fact that obviously uh, Maduro and Venezuela are very clear about not wanting to just be like a colony of U.S. business? Uh, so what do you think that would look like if, uh, you know, Venezuela agreed to let in these big oil corporations? Uh, how, how do you think that they would maintain or be able to maintain this understanding that like, no, this we are very clear about not just, you know, becoming an oil colony for the United States? Yeah, so the thing is, Chevron's been there already for, for decades and decades. They never left. In fact, Venezuela kind of had this fight already maybe around 15, 16 years ago, 2004-ish, 
when you know the government really took control of the state-owned oil company. Prior to doing that, we had this state-owned oil company called Pedesa in Venezuela, which really acted more like a private company. And two-thirds of its income prior to the revolution used to be spent intern internally. So, so two-thirds of the profits netted by this giant oil, oil company was used within the company itself rather than being given to the government, to the people, to the people whom, for whom the oil actually belongs. So we're talking about you know, huge bonuses for employees, like cars, houses, university, uh, scholarships, all if you're connected to the oil company in some way. For everyone else in Venezuela, you know, they saw very little money. That changed with the revolution, and then you know the, those oil profits began to be invested in the in the in, you know in social spending, basically social investment. The in terms of U.S. oil companies, what one of the things that Chavez did, President Hugo Chavez, the, the leader of the Bolivarian Revolution from ninety nine to two thousand thirteen, he made it so that you know the U.S. oil companies would be hold, held to joint having joint ventures with the Venezuelan state-owned oil company. So in none of these ventures do uh, does a foreign company have more than 50 percent, uh, more than a 50 percent stake? So the Venezuelan government retains control over these joint ventures. That's been the case for every oil company that's been operating in Venezuela in, over the past 20 years, including Chevron. Exxon pulled out, and there was, you know, lawsuits and, and counter lawsuits about, you know, in in, in, our, in global arbitration courts. But Chevron has stayed there. And in fact, when the Trump administration started impose, imposing all these heavy sanctions on, on Venezuela, Chevron kept getting an exception and they were kept getting a waiver. And what they used, used to do was that, you know, instead of paying, you know, Chevron profits, which is, you know, what they were entitled to, the sanctions made it so that Chevron could only receive, you know, debt um, repayment. So, so that was kind of the scheme that was, had been working on the US, that Chevron had been working with on Venezuela from 2017 to roughly 2020, December of 2020, when the Trump administration ended that program. And now Chevron wants back in because they have you know, a lot of money invested there. Venezuela still owes them some money. So they, they're desperate to like, continue their operations, but the US government hasn't let them. In terms of for Venezuela, you know, I think there are concerns that too much has been given away to private corporations over the last couple of years in order to try to fight this economic war. And I think that's kind of a, you know, a, an ongoing debate within the left in Venezuela is how much are we going to open up these spaces for private corporations, understanding that we're under an economic war and that under normal circumstances, these corporations wouldn't get, you know, more, more space given to them. So, so it's kind of a, a give and take between, between, you know, the kind of the hardcore left and the kind of what, what, what we can talk about as the more pragmatic left in Venezuela. But I think there are, you know, mechanisms through which, you know, Chevron and any other oil company can be and have a profitable experience in Venezuela without, you know, entering into the sort of kind of colonial mindset that we've seen uh, oil companies engage with in the past. So let me give a real quick example of Guyana. It just came out in the news that Exxon, which has major oil investments in Guyana, is not going to have to pay any profits to the Guyanese government because they came up with this crazy scheme where the profits are going to be reinvested into Exxon facilities in Guyana. So it's this kind of loop where all the money that for Guyanese oil is going to go into Exxon's coffers rather than the Guyanese people. That's not going to happen in Venezuela anytime soon. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> um... Yeah, it's amazing when a uh, when a government seems to prioritize the you know the well being of the people and uh, has mechanisms in place to ensure that there can't be a corporate takeover of that government. Uh, fascinating concept. Um, <laughs> so I also want to you, you know you're talking about like there's a conversation happening on the left about what the best path is. I'm also curious with uh, what that conversation is like with regards to you know opening talks with the opposition because as I understand it, the United States is still under the uh, uh, under the assumption that uh, Juan Guaido is the president of Venezuela. and so I don't know who they think they're talking to when they're talking to the president-elect Maduro, um, a very bizarre kind of soap opera there. Uh, but how, how are people feeling about opening talks with the opposition who basically tried to stage a coup? And I mean, it would be like in the US if there was a, a party that tried to stage a coup and then the, the, the party in power was like, but let's talk to these people. I mean, the, the amount of uh, the, the, like how calm and collected the government seems to be in Venezuela with regards to this is really 
amazing, but I'm curious what the feeling is there about like opening talks with the opposition. And is that really going to do anything or is the opposition just trying to gum things up and perpetuate this uh, economic warfare? Yeah. So the thing is there have been talks with the opposition. And when we say the opposition, again, it's this vast network that is not united. It's very divided. Right. And there have been talks since, you know, 2017 really. And in fact, in early 2018, the, the two sides were had this comprehensive agreement all drafted out. They, they you know, were waiting on the final parties to give the say-so, and they were going to sign this agreement in the Dominican Republic, and everything was looking rosy. And that one-week interim, where the way they drafted the agreement and they were going to agree to sign it, the U.S. basically sabotaged the talks because they said that they would welcome a coup. They said that you know, they might impose oil sanctions. So the U.S. made it clear that they didn't want talks between the Venezuelan government and that opposition that was during the Trump administration. That was 2018. They did the same thing again in August 2019. And then again, August 2021, 20, when these talks started between the, op the opposition led by Juan, Juan Guaido and the Maduro government, the gov Maduro government made it clear that you know, this, there was a Venezuelan diplomat named Alex Saab, who was at the time under arrest in Cape Verde, Cabo Verde, a West Island nation, uh, an island nation off the West coast of Africa. And they said that if anything happens to, to Alex Saab, if he's extradited to the US, these talks are gonna end. Well, lo and behold, in October, Alex Saab is extradited to the US and the, and the talks ended. So the Venezuelan people, they do are in favor of the talks. They're particularly more in favor of the talks with the more moderate opposition that has been participating in elections. But when it comes to the Juan Guaido faction, I think that they are, they are, they're, they're certainly in favor of talks because it's really understood that, you know, without these sort of talks and the sanctions can never get lifted. And everyone understands now in Venezuela that the sanctions are the root cause of many of the country's problems. I think sanctions, I think 80% of Venezuelans in the latest poll I saw are against the sanctions, which is a huge number because in 20, you know, 15, 2016, most people didn't think the sanctions were having any sort of impact at all when in fact they were. So the Venezuelans do are in favor of the talks, but there is kind of growing, growing like animosity towards Juan Guaido and a growing push to get Juan Guaido arrested. So, you know, ironically, this, these talks between the Biden administration and the Maduro government, which Guaido wasn't even aware of, they might have saved Guaido in, uh, from being arrested because there, again, there's been this push from the grassroots in Venezuela to get Guaido arrested. This has been a growing movement, especially since Alex Saab, the Venezuelan diplomat, was arrested by the U.S. And so, you know, the Venezuelan people are sick of Juan, Juan Guaido. Last year, a poll came out that showed him having 4% approval rating. I, I mean, he, he has no support in Venezuela. People are angry with him. But they understand the reality is that he represents this, you know, sec sector of interests basically U.S. interests that we have to talk to because you can't keep ignoring them and just hope that the sanctions will go away. I think, you know, the goal is to lift the sanctions. And if that means talking to Juan Guaido, if that means Juan Guaido doesn't ever get arrested, well, I mean, I think that'll be a different conversation with the grassroots. But, you know, I think that's something that the government is certainly considering. Gotcha. Um... So finally, I'm just I'm I'm curious if you feel like there's a, a timeline. I um, it, it it seems like like you said that this this is not going to be any easier on uh you know on the oil markets thanks to uh, the 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 U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, I mean, it seems like there needs to be a a decision pretty pretty soon. Uh, what 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 do you see in terms of uh, the the coming weeks and months? Yeah, I mean, I think the decision has to happen before the midterms because everything points to the Republicans winning big in the midterm elections. And right now, actually, you have Republicans in the House and Senate, they propose bills to make it illegal for the U.S. to import Venezuelan oil. I mean, those bills are going to go nowhere right now, given the makeup of the current Senate and House. But if things change in November, that's a very distinct possibility that, that a bill like that could be passed in which case the sanctions are going to be enshrined into law and it's going to be incredibly difficult to lift them, just like the Cuba embargo has, was inscribed, inscribed into, enshrined into law with the Helms-Burton Act in the 90s. So, you know, we have, what, five months, six months for six, seven months for that to happen. Uh, I think it might because, again, you know, as gas prices continue to go up, as inflation continues to increase here in the U.S., there's going to be more and more pressure pressure on Biden to do something, and I think he might just cut Florida loose in terms of saying, you know what, we can't base our entire economic policy on what a few extremists in Florida want. 
and we have seven months to make that happen. I think it might happen. I, I'm, I mean, I, I sound kind of wishy-washy on it, but it is really the most hopeful I've been that it'll happen in the last three, four years. I think this is a unique opportunity because if the Republicans do win in November, then it's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, and I think it, we might be looking at a decades-long embargo like we were looking at with Cuba. Well, uh, I definitely hope that in this interim period that uh, we can get some sanctions lifted. Um, thank you so much for, for, for uh, being with us. And please tell folks where they could learn more about this issue and also follow your work. Well, definitely follow Code Pink at, on Twitter at Code Pink. And also, I just want to pitch real quick the People Summit in LA, June 8th through 10th. Uh, this is, you know, every two years, there's this thing called the Summit of the, Amer of the Americas organized by the Organization of American States. And every time they have one of those summits, there's a counter summit led by the people to talk about, you know, the truth about what's going on in all of the, in the entire region. That's going to happen in LA. Visit peoplesummit2022.org for more information. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you.